Okay, it's seven. We're calling the <clears throat> meeting to order. Um, could you call the roll, please? Yes, Pelzel. Here. Stiles. Here. Williams. Here. McQueen. Here. Dinell. Here. Also present are planner Denise Swinger and uh, village solicitor Chris Connard. Okay, um, tonight uh, we're going to um, read our minutes from May 14th and June 11th. Um, we'll have uh, communications, uh, council, or we have, uh, we have communications from Mary and McQueen uh, regarding the Housing Advisory Board documents. Um, then we'll have a council report. Um, citizens comments for anything that's not on the agenda. Um, that's when we'll open up for citizens to come in on things that we don't have on the agenda. Um, then we have uh, one, two, three, four, five public hearings, which are tax amendments um, to the zoning code, uh, which just are sort of clarifying a few things. So. First, uh, chapter 1260.02, minimum lot frontage, then 1260.03, parking and storage, 1260.04, um, uses, it's about driveways, um, 1260, and this will be also under uses, general provisions, provision, so it'll be 1260.04, We'll have to notice it again and vote on it next meeting, but we'll discuss it now um, as well. And then um, 1280.409 in definitions, adding the definition of a tiny home. Then um, just check in on old business, um, check in on the our review of the comprehensive land use plan, any new business, we'll talk about that. On the agenda planning, we have the Antioch College Pocket Neighborhood Development, the Antioch College Rezoning Request, and then the meeting will be over. Um, so first, we're going to look over our minutes. Um, have we not read either of these minutes, Judy? Correct. Okay. So first, Monday, June 11th, 2018. Um, does anyone have any... Uh, Corrections for page one. How about page two? How about page three? Um, all in favor of approving these minutes? I move approval. Oh, of sorry. Minutes. Yes, we need a motion. For Thank you. May 14th. Um, I'm going to second. June, June 11th. June 11th. Do you know? No, the 14th is we the were doing the 14th first. She, did, she, she announced it as June 11th. I'm sorry. I, cannot, I can't make the motion that I wasn't oh, there. Okay. Um, so we're doing May. May. Well, you June, only have, I just did. You did May because you only have three pages for June. And you did four pages. I did three of pages. Us. Did one, two, three. I was looking at this one. I'm sorry. Do you want me to do May 1st? It doesn't matter. <laughs> do I have a motion for June? I move. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And I abstain. Okay. As a point of order, yeah. you may... Uh, Make a motion. What you, you may, because you're adopting the minutes as a reflection of the facts of the body. Your presence isn't necessarily. There. I just can't vote on it. Well, you can actually vote on it too to, to approve the, the the activities oh, really? of the entity. Okay. Yes. Because we have been. Hmm. Anybody who wasn't there, we have been abstaining. So. Yeah, yeah. and I thought the, that we could we can't pass it without well, the, a the, quorum. The issue is, the issue is again because minutes are they reflect. Can you get your mic down? They reflect the action of the body, the administrative action of the body, and so it's. It's a motion to uh, adopt the minutes. Okay. As opposed to approving them. Yes. We've, we've gone over that actually before. You can, you can adopt, you cannot approve. Okay. Um, that's June 11th. Now let's go to May 14th. Um, <clears throat> uh, any 
uh, corrections on page one. Oh, there's a typo, I think, under communications, the uh, third line down. I think the third sentence should be preparatory to their plan submission. No. It's grammatically correct. I can change it. Pre it's P R E F A T. What does that mean? Prior to. Prefatory. Prior to. Oh, I didn't know that word. Prefatory. So we could have it is. So this is the May. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so no correction for what? Yeah. <laughs> um, page two, page three, page four. I do have one. Okay. <clears throat> Down towards the bottom, one, two, three, four, five paragraphs up from the bottom. Swinger asked about the exhibit B. This was the um, property on Livermore. And um, what I had said was that if a non-conforming lot exists prior to the 2013 zoning code and meets all other conditions for approval, um, it is grandfathered in and can be used. It's not okay. that it. It's Could not that a separate lot. No, but I think that the, then you were talking then further about being able to then have an easement to it, which is more dialogue that we were having, um, which we hadn't finalized yet. So uh, my suggestion is just saying um, that meets all other conditions for approval, you know, like setbacks and uh, lot coverage. It is grandfathered in and can be used, period, and then strike the next sentence. Got it. And then the next paragraph, Donnell commented that the property owner in Exhibit B will have to have a 60-foot access on Livermore Street, which is then narrowed to 20 feet. Um, I just, for clarification, I would want to say this is because the property owner has 120 feet or more of frontage to create a separate lot. Um, page five. All right, do I hear a motion to approve? I move that we adopt the minutes with the changes. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All abstain? Okay. Um, moving on. <clears throat> Um, we have communications about the Housing Advisory Board. Marianne, do you want to talk about these? Uh, I'll talk about the Housing Advisory Board and Council Report. Okay. So, uh, there are just a couple things coming through Council that may or may not be of concern to Planning Commission. One regards legislation about small cell towers which are small towers that are, that the um, communications companies are going to be putting up uh, to boost up the, the capacity for cell communication. And um, by state law, we have to accept that, but we've been, our legal team has been working on legislation to give us as much power as we can have in terms of where they're located and, well, basically where they're located, how they're located, where they're located. So um, then also telephone poles, maybe, we might be interested. We're, going, we've, we're putting out a RFP to replace 90 of the 180 telephone poles that need to be replaced, that, that will, the other 90 will be replaced um, by our staff. So um, that's council. Housing board will be meeting with Patrick Bowen uh, on the 17th, I think. Bowen is the person that did the housing needs assessment. And he's uh, offered to come two times, once to meet with our housing board and once to meet with council, mostly to talk about housing targeted goals. In the housing needs assessment, 
he had a page that listed the kind of housing that there was a demand for and that if we build it, they would come <laughs> within the next five years. Uh, we want to explore that with him further and also explore, well, we don't necessarily want exactly the houses that if we build it, they will come. We want a, probably a different mix of housing. So that meeting with him, uh, the housing board will be on the 17th of this month, and then on the 20th of August, he will be coming to uh, council for pretty much the same discussion. Uh, the other things that the housing board has been doing is starting to talk very preliminarily about the glass farm. Basically, what do we need to be doing in order to think about the development? You know, should we be talking to developers? Um, should we have a consultant? That sort of thing. Very preliminary. And we're also starting to look at what the properties are in Yellow Springs that could be the vacant properties or the properties on which there could be housing. Uh, so that that's that's what the housing board is doing. Also, I think in the packet there was the um, housing initiative process, which probably will just sort of stay in draft form because it is a process that may move around. I, I apologize for the smallness of the print. I had thought I had sent a different copy of it. So that's the process that council and the housing board will be using for moving <coughs> forward to develop a housing plan. Does anyone have any questions, comments, ideas? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm really confused by the process. Um, Planning Commission is the board that is responsible to look at the things in question, which lots are available, are utilities there, um, what are adjacencies, all of the checklists that we have to look at whether or not a site is suited for development or what is necessary to make that site suited for development. And I don't understand where Planning Commission's role is in the process with Council. I feel like Council is just going to do this and hand it to Planning Commission maybe and say this is what we're doing. Because it's not, right now it's just a communication. We don't have it on, <clears throat> we don't have it on an, an agenda. Um, and that really bothers me. Well, how, that, uh, thank you for bringing that up. I have been confused by that as well. So, um, I don't, is, do we want to talk about that more yeah, right I, now? I, yeah, I don't think, I think early on, I think it might have been uh, just preliminarily just the Housing Advisory Board trying to figure out uh, what the results were of Patrick Bowens, but I know, Marianne, you have asked that. Where, at what point does Planning Commission come into this? So, when anybody thinks about that, you know, I'm sure that. All the well, I, you yeah. know, from my perspective, I think that the, I think that the Ohio Revised Code is very clear that plan, that Planning Commission is a legal body that is responsible to look at any changes of land use. Um, any utility extensions, any infrastructure improvements, planning commission the body to be reviewing that um, as a matter of course. And planning commission's responsibility is to provide council with that input in, in the terms of a report or recommendations that council then can act on. And the reason that is is because we are not a political body. We are a body of individuals who deal with strictly planning and zoning issues. Um, and all of these things are planning and zoning issues. So if, if council moves, for example, if council moves forward to a point where <clears throat> they say, we want this kind of housing on this particular lot, and it comes to planning commission, and planning commission says, well, in our review, there isn't enough water service, there isn't enough sanitary service, um, there aren't ways to get storm water off of the site, excuse me, what are you going to do now? And so council could have wasted months and months and months trying to get something 
presented to the public that may not be possible that we would flush out in the first meeting. Well, we're, we're, thank you for bringing that up. We're not there yet. I mean, and that I, so let, let's just, can we take a few minutes on this? So clearly the glass farm is a major. The glass farm, at this point, I would say the glass farm and the, maybe the Kinney property, which is apparently going to be sold, but certainly the glass farm. So let's just take the glass farm. First of all, um, when I talked about housing goals, I wasn't talking about a specific site. I was talking about in general. You know, that, that the, for example, the, the, the housing needs assessment suggested that within five years, if we built 500 units of various types of housing, they would be filled. And, and it listed the different kinds of housing. So we're, council is going to be looking at not a site specific, but goals at this point. But so let's take the glass farm because nothing has, well, I shouldn't say nothing has been done. Um, Ken LeBlanc did a, a general study and there was Terracon, is that the name of it, did some uh, technical soil, soil analysis. Soil so those analysis. are the two studies plus some studies were done years ago too. Those. So we're, we're, nothing else has been done on the glass farm. So Ted, would you suggest that council direct planning commission sooner than later yes. to look at the glass farm Absolutely. and analyze it? I think all of the, the data is on the table and it goes all the way back to visioning, the visioning, the zoning code changes, um, the public dialogue about development areas is on the table, it's been on the table. The housing needs assessment was a piece that was needed to be added. The soil borings were pieces that needed to be added relative to the glass farm. Um, LeBlanc's plan was approved by council as a concept to look at how density could be done. I mean, it's like, okay, here we are. I'm waiting because I want to see something happen. Okay. And I, you know, at this point, planning commission could very easily go. And I, I took the time to kind of go through a, a process for what planning commission's checklist is. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm happy to share that. I, you know, it's a, you know, we look at mm -hmm. zoning issues and those are, uh, I talk about how the stormwater works into the wetlands. I talk about how that wetland can't be disturbed or not. You know, what distances do we need to establish to stay away from that to preserve that wetland? You know, what are the adjacencies to the plat next door to the Kenny property, to the solar farms? Do the solar farms want to be expanded? Do we want to leave that? Those are things that we talk about. And that will set the stage then for what council then can come back with and say, we've got all the criteria. What are we going to do with it? How are we going to make this public? How are we going to spend monies to improve the, the extensions of utilities and roads, or are we? Well, my sense is that it's council's job to say, for example, I'm making this up because the council hasn't done it yet. We want to have one third of the housing units on the glass farm be rental. And we want 80% of the housing units on the glass farm to be moderate or low income housing and 20% to be market rate. And I've just made that up. Mm -hmm. But I see that, those, that area that be, to be council's purview. It you, can very well be, yeah. So all we're, do, all we're doing is talking about the the opportunity to make that property developable, and what constraints we think that need to be considered, and you know studying adjacencies is part of it. We can, and, you know, then to define what those areas are and how big they are, and then council can say we want X, Y, Z. We can, if, you know, I think this is a a. I, don't, I mean, like, we could do that. We could put on our agenda, look at the glass farm without council asking us to do that and make a report to council. And, you know, especially knowing from these communications from Mary Ann, this is why she's here, right? Uh, obviously other reasons too, but um, so that we know what they're thinking about, you know, we don't have to wait for them to ask us to do that. We can do that. and I'm 
very appreciative of the preliminary work that you've done. And then we can have actually, you know, if you're saying, you know, we have work to do before council talks about these things, and then we can also have a list of questions that we need council to answer, you know, and have a dialogue back and forth. If, if you think they should be asking us now for a report, let's start on that report. Let's put that on the agenda. You know, my sense of it is that, you know, it's council directs us with policy. Yeah. Right? I mean, and we do, you're right. I think we have the leeway to be able to take on projects that we think are important. And I think that there's, they're ongoing. You know, yeah. the active tra transportation committee is going to come up with a draft report that's just incredible that will come to us. Mm -hmm. um, I'm so excited about it. I can't wait to get that draft to share. Uh, yeah. it, it's really, really pretty neat stuff. Um, you know, that that's our job. And, you know, maybe you're right. I think maybe we should be starting to anticipate what these infrastructure issues are going to be to put them on the table so council isn't wasting it. You know, maybe we do. We come uh, first. I mean, either way, uh, I, I have not in any way been trying to leave planning commission no, out. No. I was just unclear of <clears throat> how planning commission would be involved. In yeah. my thinking about the glass farm, I would love for us to be able to start some kind of planning, uh, having that kind of information you're talking about in the fall or late this year. That's sort of my, you know, thinking about timeline thing. So it sounds like we need to put it on the agenda. Yeah. yeah. For real. And I think, you know, we've got I can just report to council that planning commission is mm -hmm. going to start studying the glass farm to look at how it is situated with the other properties, the utilities, the uh, structure, the ge geotechnical information to be able to provide council with information about where is the best place for siting housing, roads, infrastructure. So, um, can we cetera. get in our email the information that you're talking about, the um, all, all the data that you're talking about? Oh, my checklist? Well, your checklist oh, and have, also yeah, the, you know. Denise has the LeBlanc plan. Yeah. Oh, the, the LeBlanc. Concept. Mm -hmm. We all got the one report. Reports. And I, was it the, the LeBlanc, LeBlanc plan? Yeah. Yes. I think we all got that okay. um, quite a while ago. It's yeah. in our packet somewhere. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, it was better. yeah I it was, think it's okay. fascinating. I think you know we have some new people here too, mm -hmm. and I think that that you know, I think ideally we're hoping to get moving on that comprehensive plan and yeah. then look at it all. But sure. it's not going to be possible. I think we have to kind of maybe then it looks, sounds like we're going to have to kind of do things parallel. For well, a while. I think this process is you know. The, I mean, the reason that I'm thinking about it is because of the comprehensive plan. I don't want to go through the comprehensive plan and talk about development areas. And if council is pushing to do something on glass farm, well, heck, let's combine those two processes right, right. and yeah. have the comprehensive plan updated when council comes back and says, we're putting this out there. That's, yeah. that's the ideal world. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, <clears throat> you we're going to start gearing up again with more um, uh, developments that are going to come our way as well. So I think that we are going to have to um, meet more than once a month. It's just okay. not we're not going to be able to accomplish all of this. That's okay. Once a month because yes. um, Antioch's coming uh, next month and the month after, um, and uh, Homing's got some projects they're going to want to come forward with and there's businesses in town that have ideas that they want to come forward with. It, we're going to have a lot in the near future on top of the comprehensive plan and things like this. So I think we're going to have to meet more than once um, And we were talking earlier, I just as part of the council report, um, there's a special meet, special council meeting on either, do you know the 30th or the 31st, Judy? It's the 30th. The 30th? And um, staff, yes. infrastructure staff uh, is Johnny making Burns, a report. Johnny Burns, Public Works is yeah. going to be, and his staff are going to be making a presentation to council yes, on the right. state of the infrastructure. So and, you'd like us to and do it's, that? If you could, that would be really great. Five. Five. It starts at 5. July. starts at 5. 30th at 5. Yeah, thank you for remembering that. I was going to say. And yeah. I also have a comment on something that Mary Ann. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what? And it has to do with your report to the village managers. 
Um, Report. I would like us. Oh. I would like this group to consider the inclusionary zoning. Um, I think that is too important of an issue for it not to be discussed by all of us and not to go to full council. Um, I think that there are communities that it's been very effective in, and it may be something that may be a challenge, but I think that with us looking at expanding housing in this community, I think it would be unwise if we do not consider inclusionary zoning. Well, I started off definitely wanting inclusionary zoning. And after talking to about six professionals in affordable housing, and I have talked all, to they all said it doesn't we don't think inclusionary zoning will work in this community. Inclusionary zoning works where you have a lot of development happening, which we don't really. And there's that demand, you know, a developer is not going to turn a, a development away. So affordability, though, doesn't have anything to do with developers not wanting to build in Yellow Springs. There were other factors that were going on. And so I don't think that we can put that on affordability. I think that has been one of the most important issues in this community, affordability living here affordability having housing and I think we would be lax if we don't consider it and consider you know how we can make it work I've talked to some of the people that you talked with and they are not I mean they told me they're not saying it wouldn't work but it could be a challenge you know but we're creative folks and we ought to think about how we could make it work in this community I would add to that though that during the rezoning rewrite um, we made a conscious effort all the way through that process to not be um, prohibitive, but use incentives to mm -hmm. increase values that we want into a plan. And we were successful. So there are no punitive sections in our zoning code. If we put inclusionary zoning in, we'll have one. And I think that if we had a, a CIC, or if we had some other mechanism to really be able to negotiate what incentives should be, extension of utilities, building a road, building stormwater, um, extending utilities, things like that is an offer, we're gonna get more from the developer in return. And if we have inclusionary zoning, they will stick to that minimum number that we put on them and not negotiate hardly anymore. That's why it doesn't work very well. Just as a, from a developer, I would, I would still like it to be out there for all of us to discuss it and to look at it. How, how would you like to do that? Um, I think it should be on our agenda. No, but I mean, and do you want, are you willing to get the information from different sources to bring? I can. I mean, I have a lot. I can email you the names of the people I've talked to and all, you know, whatever information I have in my electronic file. There's also the a toolkit. I mean, there's a lot of information mm -hmm. about it. It would take, when I asked how long they, it would take to develop it, a year minimum was what I was told. Um, and, and, and then once you have it in place, you have to have someone who monitors it mm -hmm. and is in charge. You have to have staff involved. In it. So it's not, it's not just you take a couple years to write this thing, then you have to have ongoing monitoring of it. But I will um, send you information okay. and I think it should be termed that we're going to revisit inclusionary zoning because it was vetted at nauseum during the zoning code rewrite so it's vetted sort of it's a different kind of zone zoning code is that what I'm getting yes what it is is that um, and it would work mostly with PUDs um, there might be other options it, it, it says if you're going to develop, let's say, more than five housing units, a certain percentage, half, I'll, I'll say 10. If you're going to develop more than 10 housing units, 20% of those units have to be affordable to people of a certain income. Oh, okay. and, or you could say, and if you're not willing to do that, then you have to pay a fee that goes into a pot oh, okay. that, is, that supports affordable housing. Thank you. Um. Are we, are we ready to move on? Sure. Yeah. Do you want, 
Or is there anything else, Marianne? No, except um, I think that when we do agenda planning, let's talk about how we want to start looking at the glass farm. I mean, okay. Yeah. Okay, um, now I'm going to open up for citizen comments. If either of you would like to comment on something that's not on the agenda, um, now is your time. No? No, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for Involved being here. Involved active citizens. I'm um, going to close the public this comment time um, and uh, move on to our tax amendments first on the docket is um, chapter uh, 126002 minimum lot frontage clarifying the meaning of the zoning code as it relates to future road access easements Um, staff? Yep. Okay, so um, we talked quite a bit about this. Um, at the last meeting, um, we reviewed uh, driveway standards and talked about how this would work. And I tried to come up with something. You, you received a handout that came from uh, Chris, which um, he made some additional changes to it. Um, and I'll let him explain that part, but essentially, um, to, in order to clarify the 1260.02 average, um, I'm sorry, 1260.02a minimum lot frontage, um, it kind of became important then to, um, or e, minimum lot frontage, it, kind of, it really became important to expand that. So, so it was clear to developers, it was clear to residents, clear to staff what, what that meant. Um, so uh, I took a swipe at it. Um, I, I, I looked at Xenia Township and how they had written it, and then our legal took a further swipe at it. Um, I know you had asked to have some sort of diagram, um, which I attempted to do. Um, showing how that would work in terms of how the minimum lot frontage would carry on. Um, it doesn't end at the property line, but then continues further for whatever the footage is for that minimum lot, but it can either, depending on the property, it could either be um, carried on to um, the uh, person who is granting the easement across their property to the dominant, they call it, or it could actually be on the dominant's inside property line. And I did check with legal on that, and that they, they didn't have an issue with that. It just depends on, it, and it will depend on how it how it fits. Um, and each lot will be different depending on how it's um, landlocked, as to what will determine what property it will run across. I love these diagrams. I think they're very helpful. So if you look at the one the handout that came from Chris, Chris, you wanna you wanna go over that a little bit? Sure. Um, the uh, I, I think the change that you see in uh, the twelve oh twelve sixty oh two E um, just to make sure that we're using the proper word frontage yes. is the correct word to use there rather than width. Um, in 1260.03, since we're incorporating that access easement standards uh, within 1260.03 and it's incorporated by reference in E, we thought adding the, tie, the, the actual access easement and driveway standards in the title would be helpful to anybody going into the code to understand where they needed to look. Um, conceptually, uh, Denise and her discussions with Patty uh, just wanted to make sure that, that any private arrangement that any villagers would enter into, it would be clear that one, that needs to be recorded in some way so there's a permanent record of what that arrangement is. Uh, two, 
uh, the village is not responsible for the maintenance of any private drive and or turnaround. If you read, if a driveway is longer than 1,000 feet, there would be some expectations for even pulling over to the side or some type of roundabout for emergency vehicles and, frankly, other vehicles. Um, That's actually, we, can we discuss that now because we're, we need to do E and the, don't we have to do these separately? Well, yes, but okay. I'm kind of giving an overview okay. and then okay, you can go sorry. through each yeah. piece. Um, and so how to show how they, they blend together. Of course. So uh, f functionally, what we want to see is that there, there's going to be a recorded easement document. Um, and what that, that our expectation is that that document will address responsibilities of the property owners based upon that easement language, the requirement that it be recorded, that the village doesn't have any responsibility. And I also think it's important this sentence uh, that's in the middle, uh, and it's between two unedited parts, but an additional curb cut for the second driveway shall only be permitted if the lot frontage exceeds by 15 feet the minimum lot frontage requirement of the respective zoning district. Mm -hmm. Denise put that in there, and it makes a lot of sense. I think you would agree. It's because we don't want to increase the number of curb cuts because it impacts parking and, and other aspects of the street. So um, by way of example, if we were in... Denise, I'll probably botch this up, so correct me. C, <laughs> Residential C, which is 40-foot frontage. If you wanted to put that second curb cut in there, it would be possible if you were 50, at 55 feet. So, uh, which then would encourage the, the use of access easements, one driveway. And again, if you're going to use that one driveway, then those property owners better do it the right way. Uh, that would lead to another question of whether or not you want this, these issues to come before planning commission, that, that's a broader question, or if the zoning administrator would handle it. But in the context of 1260.02 and 03, that's how we see the integration of it in, in the simplest way without having to go and do wholesale changes within the zoning code. Right now, um, they just go, they're just handled by the zoning staff. Um, these are these could be dramatic changes uh, I mean if you think that you, you'd rather see these types of applications come before the Planning Commission that can we can make that happen as well can you make it a conditional use type of thing where we should at least I think that any time that a property owner is splitting his lot up for new residential units on something that's already designated as a single family that the neighbors should be notified of that change. Well, the split in the lot would come to us, but uh, yeah, it, but if there's a landlocked lot that they're granting an easement to that exists, that wouldn't come to us. Right now, right right now, mm -hmm. that's not none of that is in the zoning code where the conditional use is. It's in the planning code, but it does say in the planning code that if you in a lot split, um, it, I have to bring it to you, and it basically sits as a consent agenda. If you have no issues with it, then it's considered mm -hmm. yep. approved. Like what our minutes? If it's a replat um, where oh, it's may. the same number of lots or less, I don't even have to bring it. If it's three or less, I if think. it if it's the same. Right. number of lots or less, or less. that are yeah. graded mm -hmm. as a result of the replat, I don't bring it to anyone. Mm -hmm. So right now, it's not in the zoning code. It's so I'm not sure how. I used you could put language in the in the in the planning code that says we could. I I think that the one of the issues is and Ted, I wasn't at the last meeting, but it was the meeting before that when this is the flag lot discussion first came up, and in the context of a residential A, for example question is, are all neighborhoods the same? Um, and in a residential A, what would the impact be of that community or in that, that, that neighborhood? Um, certainly that's a policy decision, uh, and I think that there's, there's valid arguments in either, either way. Um, certainly the village, I think, has an, uh, a, I'll use the phrasing, unusually high number perhaps of odd lots uh, and this desire to get the infill makes some sense and to encourage that. Um, but I guess to the extent that there's unintended consequences, there is some logic in, in bringing that before the Planning Commission. 
you know, so I mean, when I lots are split, does that go, is that publicly notified and everything, or does it just go on the consent agenda? When, when a lot is split? Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to us as a consent it, agenda. It's not, um, there's, it's considered a minor subdivision. Um, technically, you don't have to publicly notice it. Do you send out notices to... Mm -hmm. No, I have I have when they when I've done they're going to be controversial. I've okay. done that, but I don't have to. Um, as long as it's five lots or less, or less than five lots, I can't remember. Otherwise, then if we kick up, then it doesn't become a minor then subdivision. It, then it's not a minor a subdivision; it's thing. a major subdivision. Yeah, but it's, well, putting a pin in that for just a second. If you go back uh, in the report that I gave you. Um, turn, let's see, to, I should have numbered this. There's a page called 122606 Design Standards that was supposed to be labeled Exhibit A. I don't know what happened. Mm -hmm. um, see here, 122606. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That was the Exhibit A that I think, what I found interesting in this was that when we talked about how did some of these properties in Residential A end up having these these driveways that led back to and it was interesting because there was a thing in there there was a section in there under lots about every lot shall butt on a street blah 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 and then it says uncommon lot configurations may be incorporated into a development where such division poses no apparent nuisance and the commission deems it appropriate approval of such lots shall be granted upon review of the additional criteria and what number C of that was a minimum frontage of 20 feet shall be required for all such lots. Mm -hmm. So that's probably how that has happened before. Um, so, so we're not changing the code, we're making it consistent. Well, this just was, you know, I tend to usually work with the zoning code and not the planning code. And mm -hmm. so this, you know, seeing this in the planning code was like, whoa. Okay, so, um, but if you are doing a lot split, then I, w I do go to the planning code. Um, and that's in a different section. I don't, it was, that's not in here, let's see. But there's a section for replats, there's a section for minor subdivisions. And then there's, of course, one for major subdivisions. Twelve twenty six eleven and twelve. Yeah. So twelve twenty six eleven approval of a minor subdivision without formal action by the planning commission and council can be shall be granted if the record plan meets all of the following. It's located on a public road. It's no more than five lots. It's not contrary to any other zoning regulations. It's not been involved in any, you know, stuff like that. So I've been able to do that. Um, I guess in the case of these, um, where it's not located along an existing public road, then it would have some sort of formal action by council. By commission. By commission. It says commission and council. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And I think that's how we, we uh, did that for the access easement off of Dayton Street. We went ahead and formally announced it, brought it here. You had a public hearing before that lot split happened, if you recall, on that private street off of Dayton Street. We uh -huh. did do that. So in the case of the property on Quarry Street, it wasn't necessary for that because he had the frontage and the access easement was, he was sharing a driveway that was leading back. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a, uh, it wasn't a uh, lot split. 
He was just accessing a lot that was already in existence. Yeah. So I guess what I'm saying is maybe we don't have to make it a conditional use if it involves um, a lot split If it involves, well, if it involves a lot split, it already comes to us. We can talk about it if we want to. So, and we can not approve it if we want to, too. Right? Well, I mean, it goes on the consent agenda. How can we make your job easier? Well, I mean, uh, so you know what to do I mean, in I, every situation. Yeah. I have to think about this a little bit more because I because I had a couple lot splits recently, and I did have I did put it on the consent agenda. Yeah. I think I I think I'd like to May just always have it 14th. on the consent agenda at the very least. Isn't a threshold question for the Denise ought to hear from is perhaps how the, the commission feels about whether or not these should come before planning. Um, and, because certainly the impact on the neighbors is something that's important in, by going or bring whether it's consent agenda or for formal hearing we yeah. know that notice is given i mean that's the way i feel about it i you know and it's simply because of respect to the neighbor i mean i think that's our job is to look out for the interest of the community and the neighbor in case of any application so you know, I agree whether it's on consent or whether it's a hearing. I don't know that it makes any difference. But I think legally we ought to protect ourselves too. You know, if Denise approves something and the neighbor finds out about it when they see a track go pulling down the driveway, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and things get stopped and there's a lawsuit, and there's no good in that. Right. So right now, the 1226.11 minor subdivisions doesn't have that. I mean, it has um, the, the zoning administrator without formal action by the Planning Commission and Council can do these things, boom, boom, boom. And then um, as long as those, those issues are met, and it doesn't really, it's not clear as if they're not met what happens but it does not state that you have to notice neighbors so i think that needs to be added into it well if it's a public hearing then you have to notice neighbors so or, i think that's the easiest way instead of making it a special thing where it's not a public hearing and we have to notice when neighbors. it's consent agenda though you don't necessarily have a public hearing no right this is yeah, not if a we agree hearing. with it we take no action yeah. so are we saying that we should have have it on the consent agenda plus um noticing neighbors it seems to me that if the neighbors were noticed and they and they showed up that would be a citizen concern yeah and if a citizen showed up and it was on the consent agenda then you could take it off the consent agenda exactly to address but it would be different than having a public hearing. And I think part of the issue is if it's on consent agenda, they aren't necessarily noticed. Well, where, is it, where if it's, but we can make it so. So, but I, I'm, yes. you're saying let's do an in-between. Let's not make it a, this thing and let's not make it that thing. Let's do part of each. So if someone has a track of land and they have, and they have, 100 feet frontage and the requirements 50 feet and it's all clean and they can do that they have that public extension I mean they have that public street frontage then I don't know that we have to go through all that so then it would be on the consent agenda it'd be yeah, on the consent agenda can still be notified. so we're wanting to add that when things are on the consent agenda that the neighbors are noticed okay or are or you else saying how would they know if that it's happening? if it's special, like if it's, are you saying like if there's, if you're talking I, I about minimum lot frontage, 
right. I feel like it's special when you're like accessing road accesses and you're doing things like that. But at some point, what is the impact of the neighbors on something that's your? If they have a le land that they can legally zone, yeah. it's a lot. I, I, I would. So my understanding, if someone owns two lots and they have a house on one and they own the other one, but they're both separate lots, both have the right amount of frontage. I don't think we should notify the neighbors when they say, I'm going to sell my second lot. Well, it's well, not selling it's not it. That, it's like if you're, you're on the right track. If they have a big piece of property yes. and, want, and and part of that property is on, their house is on one. If and they, they just can want to legally split it. meet all the setbacks of both and all of the requirements and want to split that second okay, lot. Okay, so we're talking about so the same split thing. Split yeah, lot, well, I'm not sure why we the neighbors have a say because it's illegal i mean at some point you legally have that right to do that okay so that but if it's unusual in that it's a road access easement or it's a uh anything else where it's you know or a lot behind like they're going to create a lot like a flag line yeah. then i could see where notification to the neighbors. i mean but if they're getting all the minimums and creating a flag lot in this, you know, if they have a 20 foot, if their minimum is 20 feet and they're creating a lot behind and they're leaving 20 feet and this, their original lot stays, you that, know. But that 20 feet was in the major subdivision. Okay. I mean, so it was is like it when you're looking at a big track of land, you have these little pieces. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying. Is it 40 feet for the minimum? Frontage. I'm sorry, I don't remember. Yeah, I'm just saying that this was in there for uh, undeveloped land. Yeah, but we, we're talking about land that's that's already developed. So yeah. if there is already a house on it, and they want to split it off, and and make access to the back part of it, then like, I would think you might notice yeah. the neighbors in that situation. Yeah, I yeah. think getting back to the original thing, if it, you know, like as you said, if it, if it's a large lot and they can legally split it, and it meets all the requirements, I don't think we should be involved. I think they sh you should just be you able to. to because why make it harder for individuals if they're doing what they have the legal right to do? Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. I, you know, I think as a whole, but a flag lot creating a flag lot mm -hmm. is a different story. But if that's legal to do and they're reading all the minimum requirements to do that as well like how do we differentiate that that should be noticed is it just up to you we should just leave it up to you can we do that well, well that's why i brought up conditional use i mean conditional use is a permitted use yeah it's got conditions so i think that if somebody is creating a new developable piece of land within a district within an adjacency where people have had experienced privacies that should be a condition we sh might be able to place conditions on that mm -hmm. that's where my head's at but, but but i think that that's becomes rather than a zoning thing that that's still in the planning section of the code because it's undeveloped land that they're going to now develop so we can just add that language in into into that section of the code that that we have to uh, bring it before the planning commission and, and, and notice use. notice. Well, yeah, I mean, well, that would be that is conditionally me. allowed. Well, as I read well, this, yeah. as yeah. I read twelve twenty six oh six design standards, so I, I think we're talking about three different things. <laughs> we, yeah. We've got the flag lot issue, mm -hmm. which I, I, I'm everybody's kind of nodding their heads that that's that's an issue that probably ought to go to commission that's what I'm, I'm reading then we've got a conforming lot that's a minor subdivision lot split whatever terminology you want to use but and if it's otherwise with uh, permitted within the code that doesn't that doesn't need to get to commission because Correct. that's clearly yeah. contemplated and should be okay then you've got this third scenario which it appears at 122606 design standards is contemplating which is where you have a non-conforming lot that could be de built on and if you've got a minimum frontage of 20 feet uh, is required, uncommon lot configurations, that's a unique situation, which, by the way, would also require uh, it go to the commission because it says uh, uncommon lot configurations may be incorporated into a development where such division poses no apparent nuisance and the commission deems it appropriate. 
So it seems to me that the two issues we're talking about then, one we know, we've got a, a strange non-conforming lot that may be subject to some form of development, likely some type of affordable housing component, and then the flag lot issue, which is a newer concept for the, for the village and the planning commission wants to make sure and monitor how that goes uh, and, and that that ought to be noticed somewhere and that Denise and I need to go back in the code and see where we need to fit that in. Um, and whether or not we call it a, a, a permitted use that goes to planning commission for approval or a conditional use, uh, you know, we'll worry about the semantics later and yeah. see what makes the most sense given the current language that our code uses. Does that make sense, Denise? It does. Mm -hmm. It makes it perfect does. sense to me. It okay. does. And so I guess, um, are, are we saying now, based on here, uh, uh, in, in the uh, subdivision regulations where I found that about the undeveloped land, about the 20-foot frontage, um, are we, we're not, we're not going to touch that right now? Yeah, because that's undeveloped <laughs> land that doesn't have a house on it already. Yeah. That's kind of I the mean, difference. It's like, yeah. Is there a minimum size to that undeveloped land when that chapter? It must collectively average 100 feet of frontage? No. No? Let's see. Um, that doesn't, sorry. That's all right. Well, I think it, um, it says it, they're permitted access on local streets only, which would be an exception to if any flag lot or access easement. Yeah. It doesn't provide a nuisance to adjoining lots. Um, uh, I kind of, it's, it's in there. I mean, I think that kind of is our flag lot language, sort of. We mm -hmm. kind of do have it. But it's I only mean, for undeveloped but, lots. But the flag right? lot, though. The flag lot is, is made on a developed lot, usually. So there's already a house on it, they're subdividing it, and they're getting access behind the house. No. That's when we want to have a public hearing. That, but there's also one of the, the flag lot issues we had is that there was a landlocked parcel yeah. that could only get frontage through an access easement. Yeah, so I, and that's I, existing. That's yeah. existing, but I still think yeah. that, that, that the Planning Commission would like to hear those cases. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what I'm hearing. Yeah, okay. because I, in that particular case, I know that there are parcels in town that were originally, when the plat was created, they were originally, that lot was created for dedicated green space. And it might be in the covenants and restrictions right. of that plat that fell off the table because it yeah. was 50 years ago, right? So if you're trying you know, to I build want to make on... Sure that yeah. the neighbors are aware that they're giving up what they bought into is green space. Yeah. and just have it out there. So if someone wants to build on an existing landlocked lot, then it comes to us to be able to get grant access wherever they can get access. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I got some more to do. Okay, so we can't do minimum lot frontage. Is that how we're No, but I think thinking we're on the right it? track now, finally. But, and we, well, I'll, I'll bring back what um, Chris is <laughs> incorporated into that and then try to define a little bit more about the planning section. Yeah. Chris and I can get together on that, okay? Um, can we do 1260.03? Oh, should I have a public hearing about 1260.02? I think we just tabled it, didn't Okay. We? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's and table that, it. And we kind of pretty much tabled the next one because that has to do with that. That kind of has to do with that, yeah. And then 04 does too, yeah? Yeah, we'll strike it once we know what we've got. Well, and the one thing about 03 is I, I think that there's been enough discussion of planning about the driveway standards that we don't really need to have any discussion about that because I think yeah. we've talked about it a number of times. And yeah. So do we want to do the ti two tiny home things, yes. even though we have to re um, here re-notice re the... Mm -hmm. general provisions so yeah. let's talk about 1260.04 okay yeah let's do that because who knows this next meeting what it's going to be like anyway so mm -hmm. if we get through this and then all I have to do is say hey we've already pretty much approved it it just is a change okay. to the, the, the 1260.04 under uses uses general provisions general provisions and should we be looking at the document we just got this evening or the old one just the old, the old one. one. Just the old one. Okay. 
So, um, Rose, Rose Pelzel and Ted Donnell and Al Kuzma and I met about tiny homes. And what we basically came up with was um, that it's a structure that's built on a permit chassis with or without wheels, but it, it has to be on a permanent foundation. That permanent foundation either being slab or like soil anchors, and it has to be connected to utilities. It cannot, it's not something, um, it has to be on a permanent foundation. Um, in, the, in the discussions with Al, he, he cannot issue um, a certificate of occupancy if typically if he isn't seeing something being built. So, because he doesn't know what was done behind the walls and who knows where this um, tiny home was built before it was brought in. So, there's several different standards. Um, the manufactured homes, uh, you have to have, the pr he has to have proof of certification with a HUD seal. Um, if it's an industrialized, industrialized unit like a Unibuilt, um, they have to have a home compliance certificate that's required, proof of that, because they have these state inspectors in the factories where these are being built that actually make sure that they're building, being built to the Ohio Code. If it's built in another state, then he wants to see proof of their certificate of occupancy from that state, and if they can't come up with that, then he's not going to approve it. And he, he finally he said if it's built or constructed in another manner um, that's not where it's being constructed on the site and he has his own inspectors going out and watching it as it's being built, then he is requiring um, a certified engineer, State of Ohio certified engineer that would um, have to issue um, make an argument for issue it being, of reporters yeah. with their seal that this is meets the requirements of the Ohio's building code. That's how I understood it. Um, so at least it gives me something to tell people when they ask. I yeah, mean and it um, you know there was something I saw um, online recently where people are selling tiny house kits. So, you know, here you have now people who can buy a kit to build a tiny house and there is no compliance to them. I'm going to build this thing in my backyard and I'm gold. You know, what we're trying to say in this zoning is that no, you're welcome to do that. However, you have to get the plan. You have to have a building permit and right. then, yeah, to live yeah. in it, you have to have a. Exactly. A, Which, you know, if they yeah. get the kit, they can easily get. Green County building regulations to go out and inspect every aspect every, of it. Yeah, yeah. And he's okay with that, too. It's like um, getting a kit to build a home. Right. That's certainly not how it's advertised. But. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I it's have like, a couple <laughs> questions. Is the permanent foundation the village's requirement or the no. county requirement? County. State. State. Yeah. yeah. And to be able to get a Occupation. A certificate. Certificate. So the state requires, uh, and the same with mobile homes, the state requires it to be on a permanent foundation? It has to be anchored, not, well, a permanent foundation is when you take, when you, you put a support under the frame of the industrialized unit for the mobile home. You can support that frame with a structural foundation that anchors into frost depth. That's a permanent foundation. That's not a complete foundation. But that's a permanent foundation. You mean like pier kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, but the, the downside to that from a constructability side is that you have no protection from weather underneath that right. unit. Yes, I'm and then aware it gets of that. into, <laughs> that's why you see a lot of those south. Yeah. But right now, uh, like um, if, it, if it's on wheels and has if it's on wheels, then it's a vehicle at this point, and we don't allow people to live in 
RVs, which is right. what they would be. So if if they have if they want to live in it, it needs a uh, uh, certificate of op occupancy, and we don't give that. It's the county that gives okay. that. The other question was. Denise, I think you had come up with a, a definition of tiny homes being 400 square feet or less. Yeah, but which that's was, not reflected no, in here. No, because don't. that's not what is, I mean, we don't have any minimums, and that is not a good enough definition for Green County. Um, so instead, just basically said, spelled out those things, build on a permanent chassis with or without wheels, designed to be used as a single family dwelling, it has to be on a permanent foundation, and it has it, to be connected to It seems like there should be some kind of word, even just say a small. I mean, otherwise anything would be a tiny home. Anything on a chassis is a tiny home. No, it doesn't say. It doesn't have to have a, a chassis, does it? Yeah. Well, so the, with kind of permanent chassis, chassis, with or without yeah. wheels. I think chassis oh, implies okay, that's vehicle. part of the definition. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, that's what I, I mean, because some, some of them are... Okay, I'm sorry. I, I get it. Yeah. No. But, but, but Ted, I have a question for you. An RV could never be a permanent chassis with or without wheels. Yeah, it could. It could. Mm -hmm. okay. But what the, what the county is going to require is that it, it be attached to this foundation and that the person who owns that and submits an application for the building permit tear open all the walls so that all the electric and all the plumbing and everything is being able to be seen and then get an engineer to certify that it is in fact <laughs> so it'll never happen it's a practical impossibility <laughs> yeah pretty much <laughs> yeah I mean if you took an RV and you did the work to get an occupancy permit then you can live in it yeah. but it wouldn't be a vehicle at that point it would be permanently fixed to the not permit I mean it would be on uh, foundation and connected to utilities so it wouldn't be a vehicle at that point. And it, and it wouldn't preclude somebody who bought an RV and gutted it and wanted to literally make a home of it and put it on the site. Right. You know, they would start from scratch just like anybody else, but they would still have to have an engineer certify that the structure meets snow load and wind loads. Okay. Which is what um, Al said when I had someone who went to use C containers. Yeah. He, he yeah. said, you know, those, they, you need a certified engineer because I don't know where the steel was made and it might not be the quality and it needs to meet certain standards. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a phone call this week um, about someone who was, wanted to buy a lot and then uh, convert a school bus into a dwelling. And so, you know, it was really nice to have this. I ended up just being on the phone, but just saying, well, uh, this is what you'd have to do to, to be able to do that. And, like, yeah. Knowing that that's not going to be able to happen because, like you said, they, they basically would have to start from scratch anyway. Yeah. They'd, have that, they'd have that structure, but it wouldn't be. I'm they'd sure, really I'm have sure to in build that person's mind within it. Yeah. They're thinking, oh, you know, I wouldn't have to do that much. Right. Yeah. But in fact, so a question by looking at the uses of this, it says it's either used as a dwelling unit or an accessory dwelling unit. Mm -hmm. So if it's an accessory dwelling unit, they would then actually have to come to planning to get that approved. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. 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 Subject to whatever the minimum or the maximum square footage is for yeah. the accessory dwelling unit. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think this definition really nails it myself. I'm yeah. Real happy with it. And did that is the one, two, three, four, does that was that your understanding of how that went? Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to make sure of how that meeting went, but um, okay. I was hoping that I got that all right. You know, the essence of it is very simple that you know, if there's a certificate of compliance through HUD or a state regulatory agency or an industrialized unit state agency the county will accept that as inspected. Then the county can look at the foundation and the water and sewer connections and be done with it, the electrical connections and be done with it, then they get their occupancy. If it doesn't have that certificate on it, the county is going to require inspection 
of that structure all the way through for all of the things that they can't see, which are electric structure, plumbing, all those things, which makes people tear them apart, and that's a real problem. So getting certificates, you know, to show compliance is critical for them. Otherwise, build it on site. Yeah. And it could be a kit. Yeah. Yeah, and those kids should come with instructions about how to, you know, go through that, the yeah, permit yeah. process. But, they don't. You know. Um, okay. uh, any questions from the public about this uh, definition of tiny home? So are you, in fact, well, opening a public sorry. hearing? Yes, I'm opening a public hearing. And sorry. if you do have comments, could you come up and state your name? You have to come up and say your name. That's it. Because we're going to really be honored if you all don't know who this guy is. Hi. Ed Dresser, 223 West Davis Street, Yellow Springs, Ohio, 45387. <coughs> Well, you were talking about living in the uh, recreational vehicles. I'm kind of some concerned about parking them on the public right away and for how long. Yeah. Yeah. We, you know what I'm talking about. We just about. talked about that last meeting. That's what I thought. Yeah. And I wanted to come here tonight just to. Yeah. We, uh, we made, Planning Commission made a recommendation. Um, staff wrote a memo to council with Planning Commission's recommendations that it be um, put into the general fences code uh, under the police department and that um, we do not allow recreational vehicles um, on public right-of-ways except for the um, quick uh, uh, unloading and loading of things from it mm -hmm. um, in the past what's in the zone what's in the code the general fences code is a 72 hour rule and so I mean they could go out and chalk it and then somebody moves it four inches and say, say they moved it. But this is, is different in that, you know, you're saying, you know, you're, you're parking it here to load it, unload it, and if you're, it's still or there. Or families visiting and you're sleeping. Well, you can, in the zoning code, you can still allow a family member if it's parked on your lot, not in the street. Yep. And um, only for 72 hours. So, so if someone has a concern about that, like perhaps Ed does, he should go to the police? Once it's in the code. Okay. Which council, council has to is going So to you could tell council, because council is going to review well, it. <laughs> at our next council meeting, probably. Probably, yeah. Yes. I'm not I think sure you're up to it's September. Is it in September? It's, it's, September it's been moved to September's meeting. So that's not going to be discussed until September's meeting. September's so. meeting, though. No. That? The September's meeting, it'll be at council. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, the only other issue I was concerned about, <clears> this <throat> tied in maybe with small homes and wheels, is alleys. Alleys is my really, I love alleys, and I am concerned about making alleys primary access to a unit rather than secondary access to a primary dwelling. As the definition of an alley is. And mm -hmm. I'm just, you know, what, what happened? Well, we, Denise and I talked a lot, and over. things are working out mm -hmm. on that, but I'm still concerned about we have a lot of alleys in Yellow Springs, and, and I'm trying to get the definition of an, an alley then abandoned uh, uh, and vacated, and abandoned mm -hmm. means what? That's two different things. Yeah. Yeah. Vacated. I know what a vacate yeah, means. Yeah, right. So if you're supposed to take care of the first seven and a half feet on each side by the adjoining property owners, then why would it be abandoned? And it's really a maintenance issue, isn't that what abandoned means? Right, and the, and that's and the property owners are responsible, not the village, for maintenance of it. Right. Right. Vacating then is if if, if people don't want to use yep. it anymore, and then they ask for the village to give it up. Give it up. And then yeah. each each abutting property owner gets half of that the, okay. of that. I don't think that planning commission uh, or council unless they're you can tell unless it's an alley that definitely ha could not have any other use. It's an alley that isn't going to go anywhere. Um, I don't think they're going to um, allow for any more vacated 
always because of the future of walkability and right. what they might want to do. In the case of what Ed's talking about, he's an accessory dwelling unit um, that was built at the back of a property line and its access is through the alley, but that's a per permitted use because it is a secondary, it's secondary to the primary and just like a garage that you can have, mm -hmm. you can access it off the alley. But, but if it become a, uh, my main concern, if it became public and it, all of a sudden you got two way traffic, and seven and a half, 15 feet won't, won't, it won't work. And uh, so that's what I was mainly concerned with, is uh, two way traffic on the now, especially I live on two, you know, 60 foot street beside me and a 60 foot street in front of me and 15 foot alley behind me. And I don't particularly want to have another highway burn behind my backyard. So <laughs> that was only my concern I besides. Know. Where are our deer going to go if we close those all off? <laughs> we have three deer that are using our alley right now on West Davis. <coughs> and they're two babies. Okay, well, it's, I mean, I'm, we're just talking about alleys. We're not talking about sidewalks. Maybe we could task the deer with maintaining the alleys. <laughs> <laughs> Rather than right. like my tomato plants. And, um, right. Diversity, if you don't have Oh, any. pay them in tomato plants, right? <laughs> they're, already, they're already getting them, so it should work for their food. Well, thank you, Ed, and, uh, you know, be sure to come to the council meeting um, with the RVs parking. Okay, okay. And then I'll just, other things like this, sidewalks and things. Oh, okay. So come to the 30th um, so There'll be a sidewalk the 30th. Uh, station sometime. Um, there's a special council. Yeah, that, that's going to be talking about sidewalks. We're talking about water, sewer, oh, okay. electric. Well, well that might be an sure. interesting meeting anyway. Sidewalks are in there too, but it's about oh, yeah. finances, I think. So, okay. Okay. Thank well, you. If you're interested in finances mm -hmm. of sidewalks. Okay. Um, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Um, and so we've talked about both, well, it's really, so both 1260-02 general provisions about language regarding tiny homes and also the definition, but we're gonna vote on, or if, is really there any more that? discussion about 126002? Do you? Oh, four. Remember, I coded it wrong. If it's not coded correctly, you don't want to call the vote, but you can right. go ahead and have your discussion so that we when you come back to it, yeah. you're ready to address it. Okay, time. so on the agenda, it says 126002 general provisions, but it's going to be need to be re noticed as 126004 general provisions. Oh, I see. Um, fit better there. <laughs> So, um, so we're gonna have to do this again when we do the minimum lot frontage. Okay. Um, so, do, does everyone want to move forward, or are there more thoughts about that? I think it's well written, and I think it's brief. To I the think point. it'll be it will be able to pass it very understandable quickly. I think the yeah. next time around, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, next, uh, chapter twelve eighty four oh nine. Um, adding the definition of tiny home in definitions. Um, I just say we just bring it all back at the same time. Oh, we're going to bring it all back at the same oh, okay. time. Is okay. Is that okay? Do you want to? I mean, I had noticed it, but. If it's, if I mean, if we if rush if through noticed, and then we do it with, with council does it separately, they might get confused, right? We just no. bring it on the agenda at the council. Yeah. Council never time. gets confused. <laughs> <laughs> never gets confused. So you're saying go ahead, you're right on top. No, there's no reason not to. You're, okay. Yeah, the council's right, going to get it in serial order anyway. So. Okay. Um, discussion about that? Any more discussion about the definition? I like it. I do too. Okay. Um, I'm going to open a public hearing um, on the adding the definition of tiny home. Okay. I'm going to close the public hearing. Bring it back. Up to the table. Is there a motion? I move approval of uh, 1284.09 definition of tiny home. Second. Tamela, that was you. Yes. Mm, okay. Pelzo. Yes. Styles. Yes. yes. McQueen. 
Yes. Williams. Yes. Dinell. Yes. Approved. You've done one thing today. Yeah, it seems like you've accomplished yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's good. You're good. Okay. So um, next, uh, old business. Ted, do you want to update us about your meeting with um, yeah. Frank um, on the Frank comprehensive and I land met, use plan? We had um, a lengthy discussion about the table of contents that um, I had looked at. And his suggestion, well, he liked what I did. He said there might be a couple rearrangements, but the content was there. Um, but he, his suggestion was to go ahead and try to schedule a work session planning commission meeting to run through this and then at that meeting identify what sections we want to go through first and who wants to take on some tasks relative to those sections. So, okay. you know, I can certainly... Judy, if you want to, you know, I can hand these out, or I got one copy, but, you know, at least have to get it to everybody. Yeah. Put it in the in the packet for yeah. that meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Or get it to you before. Yeah, get it to us before. Mm -hmm. um, that sounds good. Do we want to schedule that meeting now? Sure. All right. Are you looking at past? September 4th at this point, Denise, or you? Yeah, because in, I mean, I'm going in part of July, um, a little bit in August. Um, it'd have to be the very end of August. Judy? We got, okay. no, it's both for Judy. Yeah. Um, we could do the fourth Monday in August. The 27th? Thanks, Ed. Yeah. That would be fine with me. What are we talking about? Uh, Monday, August 27th. August. I, I won't be here. I mean, clearly things can go on without me, but I won't be here. And are we looking at doing that in the evening or at when? Evening? Yeah. Um, are people able to meet earlier than the evening? Maybe at 6 or something? I am. I'm pretty flexible. And Lisa? How about you, Ren? Yep. Well, how early can you meet? Um, 4 at the earliest. Could we meet at 4? Yeah. Ooh. Mm -hmm. No. o'clock. But I just think. Well, it's a work session. No, I don't think you're going to throw anything. Is there anything a court on that day? Do you have court on Monday, the fourth Monday? Is there court held in this room? <laughs> Ask me. <laughs> I, um, it, it, I mean, I, I have no idea. I have no idea. Does anybody know if court is held more than once a month? Yes, it is, but I can't tell you if it's on that particular Monday. And well, we could go ahead and schedule one just for the court and work session be a ways ahead. Uh, and that, that's a good question as to how, how long do you need. If you schedule for 5 o'clock, you're pretty safe in terms of the use of the room regardless. I mean, a couple hours is pretty much my brain. Yeah, five, so five yeah we seven. did. Want to make it 5 to 7? I'd rather meet 4 to 6, but... <laughs> We can do. Um, 4.30. How about 4.30? <laughs> yeah. All right. Doesn't make, 6.30. Doesn't All right, 4.30 to 6.30. Great. Well, it's not going to help in terms of scheduling, if that's the issue. Yeah, I mean, well, it's so probably free after 5 o'clock. That's generally the case. But If the room is not free, we'll move to 5. Sure. But if the room is free, can we then do the earlier? Do 4? Well, the other thing, you don't have to meet in this room. You can yes. start out in the art room and move. Um, yeah, we don't have to. Okay, let's go four to six. Room. Yeah, four right. to six. Thank you. Okay. Work session. I might be in my work clothes, but. That's okay. And can you electronically yeah. send me that, Ted? Do you have that? I can scan it. Oh, you but scan if you it? don't have it. Oh, I can email. Yeah, that'd be great. I just got to put it in there. Put it in there. Okay. I have a question. I, I, I won't be here, as I said, for that meeting. I'm also going to be out of town for the next planning commission meeting. So my alternate is Lisa Krieger. I'm thinking for the work session, maybe not so important that 
the alternate come, but definitely for the September Planning Commission. Yes. I mean, so that we have that five yeah. people. Uh, yeah. Okay. What do you, Nine. And we have AJ. Yeah, but I didn't so know whether AJ can. So she yeah. wants to can come to the planning. Yeah. I'll tell her. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know whether an alternate can s sit in for a council liaison. No, I mean, it's a completely different role. So yeah, yeah that's not okay. I'll let Le Lisa know about both of those. Okay. Is that the eleventh? Okay. Um, new business. Um, no. No. Uh -oh. Not well. I want to bring Airbnb back to planning commission. Now maybe it needs, and I don't know if I, it would be under new business or agenda planning. Well, I mean, council took that away from us, so. So I should go to council first. I mean, we ha always we had made it, a recommendation, we and then they okay, did we'll different bring this things. To council first. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm if not, you want to bring our <laughs> recommendation back to them, <laughs> well. Um, I'm not trying to be salty about it, but I know. What we're starting to have investors buy up single family homes for Airbnb. Mm -hmm. That is the problem I think we need to address. We As did someone address who rents, it. I mean, both Ted and I are in an odd position with Airbnb, and I may ask Judith to bring it to council for that reason. But yeah, I, I mean, think, council pretty I much think we did should, it anyway. We, we, had, council, we had it as a conditional use, and we had all these criteria and all this stuff for transit guest lodging, and then and then council changed all that and so it's it's been in council's lap ever since so yeah. it's not even a conditional use under the zoning well, code. Well situation has changed so I will bring it to council. So it there the the thing that they did has had negative consequences totally they should address it again <laughs> and we can all well, say we told I mean, you so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, we're sorry. Not no, I'm sorry. I am salty. I apologize. <laughs> we spent months on that. And so, do we know that yes, that there have been? Yes, it, it is happening. And I okay. know also that people who are being kicked out of their apartments so yeah. that they're. Oh, my goodness. And so that, that they can be rented on a temporary basis. Yeah. But I mean, I mean, I go on Airbnb every month. And I, you know, refresh my page and I find one or two new ones. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, then I send them. In addition to what's already had been, mm -hmm. the, the, the stock of Airbnb is increasing. Mm -hmm. I'm finding wow. new ones. I'm, I'm con and I mean, I have to, it takes, it, it takes some investigating because there's, you know, unless they have a little something on the outside, you know, some, there have been some that haven't shown nothing from the, Sure. outside but you know I have my uh, utility guys that are good at recognizing stuff. mine's out there yeah I mean you know <laughs> we know yours and there we have, are these local investors um Do you know? yeah sometimes yeah. Okay. well I mean we have I mean, one we have one now that um, he's not responded to my letter or sent in the application and he he purchased this and he does not live here oh, oh. he purchased this well, it's one of the smaller homes starter homes so, I mean, I see this coming through the Housing Advisory Board in mm -hmm. regard to affordability. Yeah, sure. And well, maybe they should say something to council about it. I'm, yeah. I, that is me. Awesome. I mean, I'm not the only person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. But if you need us to make another statement, let <laughs> us know. We can But I think a lot of people... Do you know what your statement was tonight? <laughs> <laughs> we worked for months on I that. Well, I'm right we with did. <laughs> I mean, maybe I, I, you know, it's my bad for not going to the meeting, right? No, no, I, you know, I mean, you know, in my case, I would have to recuse myself. But you know, I mean, in my case, the it was literally designed and built for its purpose of being an Airbnb as a supplemental income to our property. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. and right. Right. It, keeping us here you know so there's goods and there's bads yeah you know and I certainly believe that in all sincerity believe that it the lot should be owner occupied right yeah that's the, and that yeah, really if you can do, if you can do that way. then that that's, solves a lot of that's it. the distinction because yeah. people yeah. like you like maybe your son wants to come home or mm -hmm. gets married 
he can come home and hang out in there yes. for yeah. whatever they so people have that flexibility when they do short-term rental. Yeah. And that makes sense, and I don't think we should control that. But to just buy a house and then rent it short-term, take it off the market for well, home ownership or for long-term rental. So when would we be, let's say we're going back to council. Yeah. Council needs to deal with it. Okay. Um, so, uh, um, so next meeting, we're going to hear about Anya. We are going to definitely hear about the rezoning request. Okay. okay. That's a definite. I don't think that the is going to be ready because we haven't even had um, the required staff meeting yet okay. um, with uh, Public Works. Um, the, um, oh, my. the, no, I don't think they'd be No, I don't yet, think they're ready either. Um, and then I'll be bringing back the um, these other oh, text yes. amendments. All of the text amendments that we didn't do. Right. Sure. You know, Denise, I'm curious. When I, when I do projects that I know are going to be really off different, which I do a lot of them, um, I, go, I ask, and I've done this here many times, where I've come to Planning Commission not on the agenda but not officially mm -hmm. just as a hey this is a concept I want to get some kind of an idea of where Planning Commission sees this project going before I spend my clients a lot of my clients money yeah. and that input it's almost like a work session <laughs> well but they it's so did informative. we had um, they invited F Frank and I um, to Who? meet with them Who? Are we talking about Antioch? Are we talking about Antioch or about Homeland? Yeah, well, anybody, but yeah. you know, in particular, Antioch. I mean, well, Antioch to... did give us uh, the plan yes. earlier. Yeah. Yeah, and I've yeah. got probably three pages of notes. Yeah. <laughs> based on that plan, you know, but I think that it would just, you know, if if they're not ready, and they're spending a lot of time and money, you know, I think that it just. Yeah. And, and meeting two individual planning commission members is I mean, different. That, yeah, yeah, completely different. Totally, I agree. They have to have a meeting with um, a pre-construction, pre-application conference with staff and other village officials. I mean, I think a representative for planning commission definitely should go. If you would like to be that person, that would be great. Well, I think it should. You know, I myself, I. You know, like I said, I, I like to bring projects that I'm doing before Planning Commission to get public input, which is what the body is, on what our concept is from a, the very get-go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've literally shelved projects where I could just see that this Planning Commission is going nowhere. I did that in a project in Vandalia, you know, is the co-housing community project. and they had no desire to even hear it. So I saved my client thirty, forty thousand dollars worth of fees just by doing that informal meeting. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know if you can suggest that, but I think on something like this or something that's really out of the ordinary that's gonna get a lot of public debate, it sure would be helpful for them to hear comments. Yeah, because if they come to us at a public hearing and there's a lot of people here so they're saying they're coming, no. they're going to be coming for the rezoning so i think at the rezoning at least we can try to get a feel i'll tell them to try to get a feel for what the project itself is going to be yeah. um and because they're not going to be coming for the other part until september okay and we, we can do that because they're in, in that process right now but i mean they have the requirements of the zone the zoning requirements so i think they're pretty much where what it is they need to have are they going to do a pocket neighborhood or are they going to do a PUD? They're going to do a pocket neighborhood. Good. And so the rezoning is to uh, RC, which abuts the neighbors uh, on both sides of this property. So the, they have to rezone to RC and then they're going to do a pocket neighborhood. And I think it's like maybe eight units, something like that. Cool. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> do you guys want the glass farm like a preliminary discussion on the agenda next time? We're going to talk about that when we talk about the comprehensive land use plan, right? Well, no, no. we were no. going to, we were going to, 
inclusionary zoning blast farm and comprehensive land use plan were all thrown out there tonight so i yeah. don't know how you want to do it i i heard well, inclusionary zoning is shunting off to susan for now for her to look at and and maybe bring back to the body that's that's what i was hearing yeah. out there I, I, that's what i would suggest since okay. susan you're the one that's interested i'll pass as much as oh, i know okay. yeah and the comprehensive plan is pushed to a work session so yeah so that really would, those two things are off so the agenda then, then it's just glass farm i think it would be good to have a discussion and let everybody think about it you know um i will actually send my little checklist that I did just right, okay. so everybody can look at it. Yeah, we can put it on um, put it the agenda. agenda. Okay. Yeah. Glass farm. And then, uh, Susan, you're not at the next meeting. Is that what you said? No. Nope. Okay. The next meeting. Huh? You are. I am. Okay. So, are, is uh, inclusionary zoning gonna? Or do you need a little more time? It's awful. Fast. I think I need more time. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. We'll keep that under agenda planning for future. Right. Let's see what. Okay. Um, motion to adjourn. So moved. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Good Thank job, you. everyone. Thank you. Good job. Stay here the whole time.